Chapter 9. The Fruit of Self-Realization. Mahamadi asked the Blessed One. Pray tell us, Blessed One, what is the fruitage that comes with the self-realization of noble wisdom? The Blessed One replied. First, there will come a clearing insight into the meaning and significance of things, and following that will come an unfolding insight into the significance of the spiritual ideals, paramitas, by reason of which the bodhisattvas will be able to enter more deeply into the abode of imagelessness, and be able to experience the higher samadhis and gradually to pass through the higher stages of bodhisattvahood. After experiencing the turning about in the deepest seat of consciousness, they will experience other samadhis even to the highest, the Vajravimbapama, which belongs to the Tathagatas in their transformations. They will be able to enter into the realm of consciousness that lies beyond the consciousness of the mind system, even the consciousness of Tathagatahood. They will become endowed with all the powers, psychic faculties, self-mastery, loving compassion, skillful means, and ability to enter into other Buddha lands. Before they had attained self-realization of noble wisdom, they had been influenced by the self-interests of egoism, but after they attained self-realization, they will find themselves reacting spontaneously to the impulses of a great and compassionate heart, endowed with skillful and boundless means, and sincerely and wholly devoted to the emancipation of all beings. Mahamadi said, Blessed one, tell us about the sustaining power of the Tathagatas, by which the bodhisattvas are aided to attain self-realization of noble wisdom? The blessed one replied. There are two kinds of sustaining power, which issue from the Tathagatas and are at the service of the bodhisattvas, sustained by which the bodhisattvas should prostrate themselves before them and show their appreciation by asking questions. The first kind of sustaining power is the bodhisattva's own adoration and faith in the Buddhas, by reason of which the Buddhas are able to manifest themselves and render their aid, and to ordain them with their own hands. The second kind of sustaining power is the power radiating from the Tathagatas that enables the bodhisattvas to attain and to pass through the various samadhis and samapatis without becoming intoxicated by their bliss. Being sustained by the power of the Buddhas, the Bodhisattva even at the first stage, will be able to attain the Samadhi known as the Light of Mahayana. In that Samadhi Bodhisattvas will become conscious of the presence of the Tathagatas, coming from all their different abodes in the Ten Quarters, to impart to the Bodhisattvas their sustaining power in various ways. As the Bodhisattva Vajragarbha was sustained in his Samadhis and as many other Bodhisattvas of like degree and virtue have been sustained, so all earnest disciples and masters and Bodhisattvas may experience this sustaining power of the Buddhas in their Samadhis and Samapatis. The disciples' faith in the Tathagata's merit are two aspects of the same sustaining power, and by it alone are the Bodhisattvas enabled to become one with the company of the Buddhas. Whatever samadhis, psychic faculties and teachings are realized by the bodhisattvas, they are made possible only by the sustaining power of the Buddhas, if it were otherwise, the ignorant and the simple-minded might attain the same fruitage. Wherever the Tathagatas enter with their sustaining power there will be music, not only music made by human lips and played by human hands on various instruments, but there will be music among the grass and shrubs and trees, and in the mountains and towns and palaces and hovels, much more will there be music in the heart of those endowed with sentiency. The deaf, dumb and blind will be cured of their deficiencies and will rejoice in their emancipation. Such is the extraordinary virtue of the sustaining power imparted by the Tathagatas. By the bestowal of this sustaining power, the Bodhisattvas are enabled to avoid the evils of passion, hatred and enslaving karma they are enabled to transcend the dhyana of the beginners and to advance beyond the experience and truth already attained, they are enabled to demonstrate the paramitas, and finally, to attain the stage of Tathagatahood. Mahamadi, if it were not for this sustaining power, they would relapse into the ways and thoughts of the philosophers, easy-going disciples and the evil-minded, and would thus fall short of the highest attainment. For these reasons, earnest disciples and sincere bodhisattvas are sustained by the power of all the Tathagatas. Then said Mahamadi. It has been said by the Blessed One that by fulfilling the six paramitas, Buddhahood is realized. Pray tell us what the paramitas are, 
and how they are to be fulfilled. The Blessed One replied. The Paramitas are ideals of spiritual perfection that are to be the guide of the Bodhisattvas on the path to self-realization. There are six of them, but they are to be considered in three different ways, according to the progress of the Bodhisattva on the stages. At first they are to be considered as ideals for the worldly life, next as ideals for the mental life, and, lastly, as ideals of the spiritual and unitive life. In the worldly life where one is still holding tenaciously to the notions of an ego soul, and what concerns it and holding fast to the discriminations of dualism, if only for worldly benefits, one should cherish ideals of charity, good behavior, patience, zeal, thoughtfulness and wisdom. Even in the worldly life the practice of these virtues will bring rewards of happiness and success. Much more in the mind world of earnest disciples and masters will their practice bring joys of emancipation, enlightenment and peace of mind, because the paramitas are grounded on right knowledge and lead to thoughts of nirvana, even if the nirvana of their thoughts is for themselves. In the mind world the paramitas become more ideal and more sympathetic, charity can no longer be expressed in the giving of impersonal gifts, but will call for the more costly gifts of sympathy and understanding. Good behavior will call for something more than outward conformity to the five precepts, because in the light of the paramitas, they must practice humility, simplicity, restraint and self-giving. Patience will call for something more than forbearance with external circumstances and the temperaments of other people. It will now call for patience with oneself. Zeal will call for something more than industry and outward show of earnestness. It will call for more self-control in the task of following the noble path and in manifesting the dharma in one's own life. Thoughtfulness will give way to mindfulness wherein discriminated meanings and logical deductions and rationalizations will give way to intuitions of significance and spirit. The paramita of wisdom, prajna, will no longer be concerned with pragmatic wisdom and erudition, but will reveal itself in its true perfectness of all-inclusive truth, which is love. The third aspect of the paramitas is seen in the ideal perfection of the Tathagatas, can only be fully understood by the Bodhisattva Mahasattvas, who are devoted to the highest spiritual discipline, and have fully understood that there is nothing to be seen in the world, but that which issues from the mind itself, in whose minds the discrimination of dualities has ceased to function. And seizing and clinging has become non-existent, Thus free from all attachments to individual objects and ideas, their minds are free to consider ways of benefiting and giving happiness to others, even to all sentient beings. To the Bodhisattva Mahasattvas the ideal of charity is shown in the self-yielding of the Tathagata's hope of nirvana, that all may enjoy it together. While having relations with an objective world there is no rising in the minds of the Tathagatas of discriminations between the interests of self and the interests of others, between good and evil, there is just the spontaneity and effortless actuality of perfect behavior. To practice patience with full knowledge of this and that, of grasp and grasping, but with no thought of discrimination nor of attachment, that is the Tathagata's paramita of patience. To exert oneself with energy from the first part of the night to its end, in conformity with the disciplinary measures with no rising of discrimination as to comfort or discomfort, that is the Tathagata's paramita of zeal. Not to discriminate between self and others in thoughts of nirvana, but to keep the mind fixed on nirvana, that is the paramita of mindfulness. As to the prajna paramita, which is noble wisdom, who can predicate it? When in samadhi the mind ceases to discriminate and there is only perfect and love-filled imagelessness, then an inscrutable turning about will take place in the inmost consciousness, and one will have attained self-realization of noble wisdom, that is the highest prajna paramita. Then Mahamadi said to the Blessed One. You have spoken of an astral body, a mind-vision body, manamayakaya, which the bodhisattvas are able to assume, as being one of the fruits of self-realization of noble wisdom. Pray tell us, blessed one, what is meant by such a transcendental body? The blessed one replied. There are three kinds of such transcendental bodies. First, there is one in which the bodhisattva attains enjoyment of the samadhis and samapatis. Second, there is the one, which is assumed by the tathagatas according to the class of beings to be sustained 
and which achieves in perfect spontaneously with no attachment and no effort. Third, there is the one in which the Tathagatas receive their intuition of Dharmakaya. The transcendental personality that enters into the enjoyment of the Samadhis comes with the third, fourth and fifth stages, as the mentations of the mind system become quieted, and waves of consciousness are no more stirred on the face of universal mind. In this state, the conscious mind is still aware, in a measure, of the bliss being experienced by this cessation of the mind's activities. The second kind of transcendental personality is the kind assumed by bodhisattvas and tathagatas, as bodies of transformation by which they demonstrate their original vows in the work of achieving and perfecting, it comes with the eighth stage of bodhisattvahood. When the bodhisattva has a thoroughgoing penetration into the maya-like nature of things and understands the dharma of imagelessness, he will experience the turning about in his deepest consciousness and will become able to experience the higher samadhis even to the highest. By entering into these exalted samadhis, he attains a personality that transcends the conscious mind, by reason of which he attains supernatural powers of self-mastery and activities, because of which he is able to move as he wishes, as quickly as a dream changes as quickly as an image changes in a mirror. This transcendental body is not a product of the elements, and yet there is something in it that is analogous to what is so produced, it is furnished with all the differences appertaining to the world of form, but without their limitations, possessed of this mind-vision body, he is able to be present in all the assemblages in all the Buddha lands. Just as his thoughts move instantly and without hindrance over walls, rivers, trees, and mountains, and just as in memory he recalls and visits the scenes of his past experiences, so, while his mind keeps functioning in the body, his thoughts may be a hundred thousand yujanas away. In the same fashion the transcendental personality that experiences the Samadhi Vajravimbapama will be endowed with supernatural powers and psychic faculties and self-mastery by reason of which he will be able to follow the noble paths that lead to the assemblages of the Buddhas, moving about as freely as he may wish. But his wishes will no longer be self-centered, nor tainted by discrimination and detachment, for this transcendental personality is not his old body, but is the transcendental embodiment of his original vows of self-yielding, in order to bring all beings to maturity. The third kind of transcendental personality is so ineffable that it is able to attain intuitions of the Dharmakaya, that is, it attains intuitions of the boundless and inscrutable cognition of universal mind. As bodhisattva mahasattvas attain the highest of the stages and become conversant with all the treasures to be realized in noble wisdom, they will attain this inconceivable transformation body which is the true nature of all the Tathagata's past, present and future, and will participate in the blissful peace which pervades the Dharma of all the Buddhas. Chapter 10. Discipleship. Lineage of the Arats. Then Mahamadi asked the Blessed One. Pray tell us how many kinds of disciples there are? The Blessed One replied. There are as many kinds of disciples as there are individuals, but for convenience they may be divided into two groups disciples of the lineage of the Arats, and disciples known as Bodhisattvas. Disciples of the lineage of the Arats may be considered under two aspects. First, according to the number of times they will return to this life of birth and death, and second, according to their spiritual progress. Under the first aspect, they may be subdivided into three groups. The stream entered the ones returning and the never returning, the stream entered are those disciples, who having freed themselves from the attachments to the lower discriminations, and who have cleansed themselves from the twofold hindrances, and who clearly understand the meaning of the twofold egolessness, yet who still cling to the notion of individuality and generality, and to their own egoness. They will advance along the stages to the sixth, only to succumb to the entrancing bliss of the Samadhis. They will be reborn seven times, or five times, or three times, before they will be able to pass the sixth stage. The ones returning are the Arats, and the never returning are the Bodhisattvas who have reached the seventh stage. The reasons for these gradations is because of their attachment to the three degrees of false imagination. Namely, faith in moral practices, doubt, and the view of their individual personality. When these three hindrances are overcome, 
they will be able to attain the higher stages. As to moral practices, the ignorant, simple minded disciples obey the rules of morality, piety, and penance because they desire thereby to gain worldly advancement and happiness, with the added hope of being reborn in more favorable conditions. The stream entered ones do not cling to moral practices for any hope of reward, for their minds are fixed on the exalted state of self realization. The reason they devote themselves to the details of morality is that they wish to master such truths as are in conformity with the undefiled outflowings. As regards the hindrance of doubt in the Buddha's teaching, that will continue so long as any of the notions of discrimination are cherished and will disappear when they disappear. Attachment to the view of individual personality will be gotten rid of as the disciple gains a more thorough understanding of the notions of being and non-being, self-nature and ego-lessness thereby getting rid of the attachments to his own selfness that goes with those discriminations. By breaking up and clearing away these three hindrances, the stream-entered one will be able to discard all greed, anger and folly. As for the ones returning a rats, there was once in them the discrimination of form, signs, and appearances, but as they gradually learned by right knowledge not to view individual objects under the aspect of quality and qualifying, and as they became acquainted with what marks the attainment of the practice of dhyana. They have reached the stage of enlightenment where in one more rebirth, they will be able to put an end to the clinging to their own self-interests. Free from this burden of error and its attachments, the passions will no more assert themselves, and the hindrances will be cleared away forever. Under the second aspect, disciples may be grouped according to the spiritual progress they have attained into four classes, namely, disciples, sravaka, masters, pratyagabhata, arats, and bodhisattvas. The first class of disciples means well, but they find it difficult to understand unfamiliar ideas. Their minds are joyful when studying about and practicing the things belonging to appearances that can be discriminated but they become confused by the notion of an uninterrupted chain of causation. And they become fearful when they consider the aggregates that make up personality and its object world as being maya-like, empty and egoless. They were able to advance to the fifth or sixth stage where they are able to do away with the rising of passions, but not with the notions that give rise to passion, and, therefore, they are unable to get rid of the clinging to an ego soul and its accompanying attachments, habits and habit energy. In this same class the disciples are the earnest disciples of other faiths, who clinging to the notions of such things as, the soul is an external entity, supreme atman, personal god, seek a nirvana that is in harmony with them. There are others, more materialistic in their ideas, who think that all things exist in dependence upon causation, and, therefore, that nirvana must be in like dependence. But none of these, earnest though they be, have gained an insight into the truth of the twofold egolessness, and are, therefore, of limited spiritual insights as regards deliverance and non-deliverance, for them there is no emancipation. They have great self-confidence, but they can never gain a true knowledge of nirvana, until they have learned to disciple themselves in the patient acceptance of the twofold egolessness. The second class of masters are those who have gained a high degree of intellectual understanding of the truths concerning the aggregates that make up personality and its external world, but who are filled with fear when they face the significance and consequences of these truths and the demands which their learning makes upon them, that is, not to become attached to the external world and its manifold forms making for comfort and power, and to keep away from the entanglements of its social relations. They are attracted by the possibilities that are attainable by so doing, namely, the possession of miraculous powers, such as dividing the personality and appearing in different places at the same time, or manifesting bodies of transformation. To gain these powers they even resort to the solitary life, but this class of master never gets beyond the seductions of their learning and egoism, and their discourses are always in conformity with that characteristic and limitation. Among them are many earnest disciples who show a degree of spiritual insight that is characterized by sincerity and undismayed willingness to meet all the demands that the stages make upon them.
when they see that all that makes up the objective world is only a manifestation of mind, that it is without self-nature, unborn and egoless, they accept it without fear, and when they see their own ego soul is also empty, unborn and egoless, they are untroubled and undismayed, with earnest purpose they seek to adjust their lives to the full demands of these truths. But they cannot forget the notions that lie back of these facts, especially the notion of their own conscious ego self and its relation to nirvana. They are of the stream-entered class. The class known as Arats are those earnest masters who belong to the returning class. But their spiritual insight they have reached the sixth and seventh stages. They have thoroughly understood the truth of the twofold egolessness and the imagelessness of reality. With them there is no more discrimination, nor passions, nor pride of egoism, they have gained an exalted insight and seen into the immensity of the Buddha lands. By attaining an inner perception of the true nature of universal mind, they are steadily purifying their habit energy. The Arats has attained emancipation, enlightenment, the Dhyanas, the Samadhis, and his whole attention is given to the attainment of Nirvana but the idea of nirvana causes mental perturbations because he has the wrong idea of nirvana. The notions of nirvana in his mind are divided. He discriminates nirvana from self and self from others. He has attained some of the fruits of self-realization, but he still thinks and discourses on the dhyanas, subjects for meditation, the samadhis, the fruits. He pridefully says. There are fetters, but I am disengaged from them. His is a double fault. He both denounces the vices of the ego and still cling to its betters. So long as he continues to discriminate notions of dhyana, dhyana practice, subjects for dhyana, right knowledge and truth, there is a bewildered state of mind, he has not attained perfect emancipation. Emancipation comes with the acceptance of imagelessness. He is master of the dhyanas and enters into the samadhis, but to reach the higher stages, one must pass beyond the dhyanas, the immeasurables, the world of no form, and the bliss of the samadhis into the samapatis, leading to the cessation of thought itself. The dhyana practitioner, dhyana, the subject of dhyana, the cessation of thought, one's returning, never returning, all these are divided in bewildering states of mind. Not until all discrimination is abandoned is their perfect emancipation. Thus the Arats, master of the Dhyanas, participating in the Samadhis, but unsupported by the Buddhas, yields to the entrancing bliss of the Samadhis, and passes to his Nirvana. Disciples and masters and Arats may ascend the stages up to the sixth. They perceive that the tribal world is no more than mind itself. They perceive that there is no becoming attached to the multiplicities of external objects, except through the discriminations and activities of the mind itself, they perceive that there is no ego soul, and, therefore, they attain a measure of tranquilization. But their tranquilization is not perfect every minute of their lives, for with them there is something effect-producing, some grasped and grasping, some lingering trace of dualism and egoism. Though disengaged from the actively functioning passions they are still bound in with the habit energy of passion and, becoming intoxicated with the wine of the samadhis, they will have their abode in the realm of the outflowings. Perfect tranquilization is possible only with the seventh stage. So long as their minds are in confusion, they cannot attain to a clear conviction as to the cessation of all multiplicity and the actuality of the perfect oneness of all things. In their minds the self-nature of things is still discriminated as good and bad, therefore, their minds are in confusion, and they cannot pass beyond the sixth stage. But at the sixth stage all discrimination ceases as they become engrossed in the bliss of the samadhis, wherein they cherish the thought of nirvana, and, as nirvana is possible at the sixth stage, they pass into their nirvana, but it is not the nirvana of the Buddhas. Chapter 11 Bodhisattva hood and its stages. Then said Mahamadi to the Blessed One. Will you tell us now about the disciples who are Bodhisattvas? The Blessed One replied. The Bodhisattvas are those earnest disciples who are enlightened by reason of their efforts to attain self-realization of noble wisdom, and who have taken upon themselves the task of enlightening others. They have gained a clear understanding of the truth that all things are empty, unborn, and of a Maya-like nature. 
they have ceased from viewing things discriminatively and from considering them in their relations, they thoroughly understand the truth of twofold egolessness and have adjusted themselves to it with patient acceptance, they have attained a definite realization of imagelessness. And they are abiding in the perfect knowledge that they have gained by self-realization of noble wisdom. Well stamped by the seal of suchness they entered upon the first of the bodhisattva stages. The first stage is called the stage of joy, pranudita. Entering this stage is like passing out of the glare of the shadows into a realm of no shadows, it is like passing out of the noise and tumult of the crowded city into the quietness of solitude. The bodhisattva feels within himself the awakening of a great heart of compassion, and he utters his ten original vows. To honor and serve all Buddhas, to spread the knowledge and practice of the Dharma, to welcome all coming Buddhas, to practice the six paramitas, to persuade all beings to embrace the Dharma, to attain a perfect understanding of the universe. To attain a perfect understanding of the mutuality of all beings, to attain perfect self-realization of the oneness of all the Buddhas and Tathagatas in self-nature, purpose and resources, to become acquainted with all skillful means for the carrying out of these vows for the emancipation of all beings, to realize supreme enlightenment through the perfect self-realization of noble wisdom, ascending the stages and entering Tathagatahood. In the spirit of these vows the Bodhisattva gradually ascends the stages to the sixth. All earnest disciples, masters and arats have ascended thus far, but being enchanted by the bliss of the Samadhis, and not being supported by the powers of the Buddhas, they pass to their nirvana. The same fate would befall the Bodhisattvas except for the sustaining power of the Buddhas, by that they are enabled to refuse to enter nirvana, until all beings can enter nirvana with them. The Tathagatas point out to them the virtues of Buddhahood, which are beyond the conception of the intellectual mind, and they encourage and strengthen the Bodhisattvas not to give in to the enchantment of the bliss of the Samadhis, but to press on to further advancement along the stages. If the Bodhisattvas had entered Nirvana at this stage, and they would have done so without the sustaining power of the Buddhas, there would have been the cessation of all things, and the family of the Tathagatas would have become extinct strengthened by the new strength that comes to them from the Buddhas, and with more perfect insight that is theirs by reason of their advance and self-realization of noble wisdom, they re-examine the nature of the mind system, the egolessness of personality, and the part that grasping and attachment and habit energy play in the unfolding drama of life. They re-examine the illusions of the fourfold logical analysis, and the various elements that enter into enlightenment and self-realization, and, in the thrill of their new powers of self-mastery, the bodhisattvas enter upon the seventh stage of far-going, during Gama. Supported by the sustaining power of the Buddhas, the bodhisattvas at this stage enter into the bliss of the samadhi of perfect tranquilization. Owing to their original vows they are transported by emotions of love and compassion, as they become aware of the part they are to perform in the carrying out of their vows for emancipation of all beings. Thus they do not enter into nirvana, but, in truth, they too are already in nirvana, because in their emotions of love and compassion, there is no rising of discrimination, henceforth, with them, discrimination no more takes place. Because of transcendental intelligence only one conception is present the promotion of the realization of noble wisdom. This is called the bodhisattva's nirvana, the losing oneself in the bliss of perfect self-yielding. This is the seventh stage, the stage of far going. The eighth stage is the stage of no recession, akala. Up to this stage, because of the defilements upon the face of universal mind, caused by the accumulation of habit energy since beginning less time, the mind system and all that pertains to it has been evolved and sustained. The mind system functioned by the discriminations of an external and objective world to which it became attached and by which it was perpetuated. But with the Bodhisattva's attainment of the eighth stage, there come a turning about within his deepest seat of consciousness, from self-centered egoism to universal compassion for all beings, by which he attains perfect self-realization of noble wisdom. There is an instant of cessation of the delusive activities of the whole mind system, the dancing of the waves of habit energy on the face of universal mind are forever stilled, 
revealing its own inherent quietness and solitude, the inconceivable oneness of the womb of Tathagatahood. Henceforth there is no more looking outward upon an external world by senses and sense minds, nor a discrimination of particularized concepts and ideas and propositions by an intellectual mind, no more grasping, nor attachment, nor pride of egoism, nor habit energy. Henceforth there is only the inner experience of noble wisdom, which has been attained by entering into its perfect oneness. Thus establishing himself at the eighth stage of no recession, the bodhisattva enters into the bliss of the ten samadhis, but avoiding the path of the disciples and masters who yielded themselves up to their entrancing bliss, and who passed to their nirvanas, and supported by his vows and the transcendental intelligence which now is his and being sustained by the power of the Buddhas. He enters upon the higher paths that lead to Tathagatahood. He passes through the bliss of the samadhis to assume the transformation body of a Tathagata, that through him all beings may be emancipated. Mahamadi, if there had been no Tathagata womb and no divine mind, then there would have been no rising and disappearance of the aggregates that make up personality and its external world, no rising and disappearance of ignorant people nor holy people, and no task for bodhisattvas, therefore, while walking in the path of self-realization and entering into the enjoyments of the samadhis. You must never abandon working hard for the emancipation of all beings, and your self-yielding love will never be in vain. To philosophers the conception of Tathagata womb seems devoid of purity and soiled by these external manifestations, but it is not so understood by the Tathagatas. To them it is not a proposition of philosophy, but an intuitive experience as real as though it was an amalaka fruit held in the palm of the hand. With the cessation of the mind system and all its evolving discriminations, there is cessation of all strain and effort. It is like a man in a dream who imagines he is crossing a river, and who exerts himself to the utmost to do so, who is suddenly awakened. Being awake, he thinks. Is this real or is it unreal? Being now enlightened he knows that it is neither real nor unreal. Thus when the bodhisattva arrives at the eighth stage, he is able to see all things truthfully and, more than that, he is able to thoroughly understand the significance of all dreamlike things of his life, as to how they came to pass, and as to how they pass away. Ever since beginning less time the mind system has perceived multiplicities of forms, conditions, and ideas, which the thinking mind has discriminated, and the empirical mind has experienced, grasped, and clung to. From this has risen habit energy that by its accumulation has conditioned the illusions of existence and non-existence, individuality and generality, and has thus perpetuated the dream state of false imagination. But now, to the bodhisattvas of the eighth stage, life is past and is remembered, as it truly was a passing dream. As long as the bodhisattva had not passed the seventh stage, even though he had attained an intuitive understanding of the true meaning of life and its maya-like nature, and as to how the mind carried on its discriminations and detachments, yet, nevertheless, the cherishing of the notions of these things had continued and, although he no longer experienced within himself any ardent desire for things nor any impulse to grasp them yet, Nevertheless, the notions concerning them persisted and perfumed his efforts to practice the teachings of the Buddhas and to labor for the emancipation of all beings. Now, in the eighth stage, even the notions have passed away, and all effort and striving is seen to be unnecessary. The Bodhisattva's nirvana is perfect tranquilization, but it is not extinction nor inertness, while there is an entire absence of discrimination and purpose, there is the freedom and spontaneity of potentiality that has come with the attainment and patient acceptance of the truths of egolessness and imagelessness. Here is perfect solitude, undisturbed by any gradation or continuous accession, but radiant with the potency and freedom of its self-nature, which is the self-nature of noble wisdom, blissfully peaceful with the serenity of perfect love, Entering upon the eighth stage, with the turning about at the deepest seat of consciousness, the bodhisattva will become conscious that he has received the second kind of transcendental body, Manamekaya. The transition from mortal body to transcendental body has nothing to do with mortal death, for the old body continues to function, and the old mind serves the needs of the old body, 
but now it is free from the control of mortal mind. There has been an inconceivable transformation death, Axindya Paranama Sayudi, by which the false imagination of his particularized individual personality has been transcended by a realization of his oneness with the universalized mind of Tathagatahood, from which realization there will be no recession. With that realization he finds himself amply endowed with all the Tathagata's powers, psychic faculties, and self-mastery, and, just as the good earth is the support of all beings in the world of desire, Karmadathu, so the Tathagatas become the support of all beings in the transcendental world of no form. The first seven of the Bodhisattva stages were in the realm of mind, and the eighth, while transcending mind, was still in touch with it. But in the ninth stage of transcendental intelligence, Sadhyamati, by reason of his perfect intelligence and insight into the imagelessness of divine mind, which he had attained by self-realization of noble wisdom, he is in the realm of Tathagatahood. Gradually the Bodhisattva will realize his Tathagata nature and the possession of all its powers in psychic faculties, self-mastery, loving compassion, and skillful means, and by means of them, will enter into all the Buddha lands. Making use of these new powers, the Bodhisattva will assume various transformation bodies and personalities for the sake of benefiting others. Just as in the former mental life, imagination had risen from relative knowledge, so now skillful means rise spontaneously from transcendental intelligence. It is like the magical gem that reflects instantaneously appropriate responses to one's wishes. The Bodhisattva passes over to all the assemblages of the Buddhas and listens to them as they discourse on the dreamlike nature of all things and concerning the truths that transcend all notions of being and non-being, that have no relation to birth and death, nor to eternality nor extinction. Thus facing the Tathagatas as they discourse on noble wisdom that is far beyond the mental capacity of disciples and masters, he will attain a hundred thousand samadhis, indeed, a hundred thousand nayudas of khadas of samadhis, and in the spirit of these samadhis, he will instantly pass from one Buddha land to another, paying homage to all the Buddhas, being born into all the celestial mansions, manifesting Buddha bodies, and himself discoursing on the triple treasure to lesser bodhisattvas that they too may partake of the fruits of self-realization of noble wisdom. Thus passing beyond the last stage of bodhisattvahood, he becomes a Tathagata himself endowed with all the freedom of the Dharmakaya. The tenth stage belongs to the Tathagatas. Here the Bodhisattva will find himself seated upon a lotus-like throne in a splendid jewel-adorned palace, and surrounded by Bodhisattvas of equal rank. Buddhas from all Buddha lands will gather about him, and with their pure and fragrant hands resting on his forehead, will give him ordination and recognition as one of themselves. Then they will assign him a Buddha land that he may pass as and perfect as his own. The tenth stage is called the Great Truth Cloud, Dharma Megha, inconceivable, inscrutable. Only the Tathagatas can realize perfect imagelessness and oneness in solitude. It is Mahisvara, the radiant land, the pure land, the land of far distances, surrounding and surpassing the lesser worlds of form and desire. Karmadathu, in which the Bodhisattva will find himself at one meant. Its rays of noble wisdom which is the self-nature of the Tathagatas, many-colored, entrancing, auspicious, are transforming the triple world as other worlds have been transformed in the past, and still other worlds will be transformed in the future. But in the perfect oneness of noble wisdom, there is no gradation nor succession nor effort. The tenth stage is the first, the first is the eighth and the eighth is the fifth, the fifth the seventh. What gradation can there be where perfect imagelessness and oneness prevail? And what is the reality of noble wisdom? It is the ineffable potency of the Dharmakaya, it has no bounds nor limits, it surpasses all the Buddha lands, and pervades the Akanistha and the heavenly mansions of the Tishita, heavens. Chapter 12. Tathagatahood, which is noble wisdom. Then said Mahamadi to the Blessed One, it has been taught in the canonical books that the Buddhas are subject to neither birth nor destruction, and you have said that the unborn is one of the names of the Tathagatas, does that mean that the Tathagata is a non-entity? The Blessed One replied. The Tathagata is not a non-entity, nor is he to be conceived as other things are as neither born nor disappearing, 
nor is he subject to causation, not is he without significance, yet I refer to him as the unborn. There is yet another name for the Tathagata. The mind appearing one, Manamekaya, which his essence body assumes at will in the transformations incident to his work of emancipation. This is beyond the understanding of common disciples and masters, and even beyond the full comprehension of those bodhisattvas who remain in the seventh stage. Yes, Mahamadi, the unborn is synonymous with Tathagata. Then Mahamadi said. If the Tathagatas are unborn, there does not seem to be anything to take hold of no entity, or is there something that bears another name than entity? And what can that something be? The Blessed One replied. Objects are frequently known by different names according to different aspects that they present, the god Indra is sometimes known as Chakra, and sometimes as Purandara. These different names are sometimes used interchangeably, and sometimes they are discriminated, but different objects are not to be imagined because of the different names, nor are they without individuation. The same can be said of myself as I appear in this world of patience before ignorant people and where I am known by uncounted trillions of names. They address me by different names not realizing that they are all names of the one Tathagata. Some recognize me as Tathagata, some as the self-existent one, some as Gautama the ascetic, some as Buddha. Then there are others who recognize me as Brahma, as Vishnu, as Ishvara, some see me as Sun, as Moon, some as a reincarnation of the ancient sages, some as one of ten powers, some as Rama, some as Indra, and some as Varuna. Still there are others who speak of me as the unborn, as emptiness, as suchness as truth, as reality, as ultimate principle, still there are others who see me as Dharmakaya, as Nirvana, as the eternal, some speak of me as sameness, as non-duality, as undying, as formless, some think of me as the doctrine of Buddha causation, or of emancipation, or of the noble path. And some think of me as divine mind and noble wisdom. Thus in this world and in other worlds am I known by these uncounted names, but they all see me as the moon is seen in the water. Though they all honor, praise and esteem me, they do not fully understand the meaning and significance of the words they use, not having their own self-realization of truth, they cling to the words of their canonical books, or to what has been told to them, or to what they have imagined, and fail to see that the name they are using is only one of the many names of the Tathagata. In their studies they follow the mere words of the text, vainly trying to gain the true meaning, instead of having confidence in the one text where self-confirming truth is revealed, that is, having confidence in the self-realization of noble wisdom. Then said Mahamadi. Pray tell us, blessed one, about the self-nature of the Tathagatas, the Blessed One replied. If the Tathagata is to be described by such expressions as made or unmade, effect or cause, we would have to describe him as neither made, nor unmade, nor effect, nor cause, but if we so describe him, we would be guilty of dualistic discrimination. If the Tathagata is something made, he would be impermanent, if he is impermanent anything made would be a Tathagata. If he is something unmade, then all effort to realize Tathagatahood would be useless. That which is neither an effect or cause, is neither a being nor a non-being, and that which is neither a being nor non-being is outside the four propositions. The four propositions belong to worldly usage, that which is outside them is no more than a word, like a barren woman's child, so are all the terms concerning the Tathagata to be understood. When it is said that all things are egoless, it means that all things are devoid of selfhood. Each thing may have its own individuality the being of a horse is not of cow nature it is such as it is of its own nature and is thus discriminated by the ignorant, but, nevertheless, its own nature is of the nature of a dream or vision. That is why the ignorant and the simple-minded, who are in the habit of discriminating appearances, fail to understand the significance of egolessness. It is not until discrimination is gotten rid of that the fact that all things are empty, unborn and without self-nature can be appreciated. Mahamadi, all these expressions as applied to the Tathagatas are without meaning, for that which is none of these is something removed from all measurement, and that which is removed from all measurement turns into a meaningless word, 
that which is a mere word is something unborn, that which is unborn is not subject to destruction. That which is not subject to destruction is like space and space is neither effect nor cause, that which is neither effect nor cause is something unconditioned, that which is unconditioned is beyond all reasoning, that which is beyond all reasoning, that is the Tathagata. The self-nature of Tathagatahood is far removed from all predicates and measurements, the self-nature of Tathagatahood is noble wisdom. Then Mahamadi said to the Blessed One. Are the Tathagatas permanent or impermanent? The Blessed One replied. The Tathagatas are neither permanent nor impermanent, if either is asserted there is error connected with the creating agencies for, according to the philosophers, the creating agencies are something uncreated and permanent. But the Tathagatas are not connected with the so-called creating agencies, and in that sense he is impermanent. If he is said to be impermanent then he is connected with things that are created for they also are impermanent. For these reasons the Tathagatas are neither permanent nor impermanent. Neither can the Tathagatas be said to be permanent in the sense that space is said to be permanent, or that the horns of a hare can be said to be permanent for, being unreal, they exclude all ideas of permanency or impermanency. This does not apply to the Tathagatas because they come forth from the habit energy of ignorance, which is connected with the mind system and the elements that make up personality. The triple world originates from the discrimination of unrealities, and where discrimination takes place there is duality and the notion of permanency and impermanency, but the Tathagatas do not rise from the discrimination of unrealities. Thus, as long as there is discrimination there will be the notion of permanency and impermanency, when discrimination is done away with, noble wisdom, which is based on the significance of solitude, will be established. However, there is another sense in which the Tathagatas may be said to be permanent. Transcendental intelligence rising with the attainment of enlightenment is of a permanent nature. This truth essence, which is discoverable in the enlightenment of all who are enlightened, is realizable as the regulative and sustaining principle of reality, which forever abides. The transcendental intelligence attained intuitively by the Tathagatas by their self-realization of noble wisdom, is a realization of their own self-nature, in this sense the Tathagatas are permanent. The eternal unthinkable of the Tathagatas is the suchness of noble wisdom realized within themselves. It is both eternal and beyond thought. It conforms to the idea of a cause, and yet is beyond existence and non-existence. Because it is the exalted state of noble wisdom, it has its own character. Because it is the cause of highest reality, it is its own causation. Its eternality is not derived from reasonings based on external notions of being and non-being, nor of eternality nor non-eternality. Being classed under the same head as space, cessation, nirvana, it is eternal. Because it has nothing to do with existence and non-existence, it is no creator, because it has nothing to do with creation, nor with being and non-being, but is only revealed in the exalted state of noble wisdom, it is truly eternal. When the twofold passions are destroyed, and the twofold hindrances are cleared away, and the twofold egolessness is fully understood, and the inconceivable transformation death of the bodhisattva is attained, that which remains is the self-nature of the Tathagatas. When the teachings of the Dharma are fully understood and are perfectly realized by the disciples and masters, that which is realized in their deepest consciousness is their own Buddha nature revealed as Tathagata. In a true sense there are four kinds of sameness relating to Buddha nature. There is sameness of letters, sameness of words, sameness of meaning, and sameness of essence. The name of the Buddha is spelt. B-U-D-D-H-A, the letters are the same when used for any Buddha or Tathagata. When the Brahmins teach they use various words, and when the Tathagatas teach they use the very same words, in respect to the words there is a sameness between us. In the teachings of all the Tathagatas there is a sameness of meaning. Among all the Buddhas there is a sameness of Buddha nature. They all have the 32 marks of excellence and the 80 minor signs of bodily perfection, there is no distinction among them, except as they manifest various transformations, according to the different dispositions of beings who are to be disciplined and emancipated by various means. In the ultimate essence, which is Dharmakaya, all the Buddhas of the past, present and future, are of one sameness. 
Then said Mahamadi to the Blessed One. It has been said by the Blessed One that from the night of enlightenment to the night of the Parinirvana, the Tathagata has uttered no word nor ever will utter a word. In what deep meaning is this true? The Blessed One replied. By two reasons of deepest meaning is it true. In the light of truth self-realized by noble wisdom, and in the truth of an eternally abiding reality. The self-realization of noble wisdom by all Tathagatas is the same as my own self-realization of noble wisdom, there is no more, no less, no difference, and all the Tathagatas bear witness that the state of self-realization is free from words and discriminations, and has nothing to do with the dualistic way of speaking, that is, all beings receive the teachings of the Tathagatas through self-realization of noble wisdom, not the words of discrimination. Again Mahamadi, there has always been an eternally abiding reality. The substance of truth, Dharmadhadu, abides forever whether a Tathagata appears in the world or not. So does the reason of all things, Dharmata, eternally abide, so does reality, Paramartha, abide and keep its order. What has been realized by myself and all other Tathagatas is this reality, Dharmakaya, the eternally abiding self-orderliness of reality, the suchness, Tathata, of all things, the realness of things, Bhutata, noble wisdom, which is truth itself. The sun radiates its splendor spontaneously on all alike, and with no words of explanation, in like manner do the Tathagatas radiate the truth of noble wisdom, with no recourse to words and to all alike. For these reasons is it stated by me that from the night of enlightenment to the night of the Tathagata's Parinirvana, he has not uttered, nor will he utter, one word. And the same is true of all the Buddhas. Then said Mahamadi. Blessed one, you speak of the sameness of all Buddhas, but in other places you have spoken of Dharmata Buddha, Nishyanda Buddha and Nirmana Buddha, as though they were different from each other, how can they be the same and yet different? The Blessed One replied. I speak of the different Buddhas as opposed to the views of the philosophers who base their teachings on the reality of an external world of from, and who cherish discrimination and detachments arising therefrom, against the teachings of these philosophers, I disclose the Nirmana Buddha, the Buddha of transformations. In the many transformations of the Tathagata stage, the Nirmana Buddha establishes such matters as charity, morality, patience, thoughtfulness, and tranquilization. By right knowledge he teaches the true understanding of Maya-like nature of the elements that make up personality and its external world, he teaches the true nature of the mind system as a whole, and in the distinctions of its forms, functions and ways of performance. In a deeper sense, the Nirmana Buddha symbolizes the principles of differentiation and integration by reason of which all component things are distributed, all complexities simplified, all thoughts analyzed, at the same time it symbolizes that harmonizing, unifying power of sympathy and compassion, it removes all obstacles, it harmonizes all differences. It brings into perfect oneness the discordant many. For the emancipation of all beings the bodhisattvas and tathagatas assume bodies of transformation and employ many skillful devices, this is the work of the Nirmana Buddha. For the enlightenment of the bodhisattvas and their sustaining along the stages, the inconceivable is made realizable. The Nishyanda Buddha, the outflowing Buddha though transcendental intelligence, reveals the true meaning and significance of appearances, discrimination, attachment, and of the power of habit energy, which is accumulated by them and conditions them, and of the unbornness, the emptiness, the egolessness of all things. Because of transcendental intelligence and the purification of the evil outflowings of life, all dualistic views of existence and non-existence are transcended, and by self-realization of noble wisdom, the true imagelessness of reality is made manifest. The inconceivable glory of Buddhahood is made manifest in rays of noble wisdom, noble wisdom is the self-nature of the Tathagatas. This is the work of the Nishyanda Buddha. In a deeper sense, the Nishyanda Buddha symbolizes the emergence of the principles of intellection and compassion, but as yet undifferentiated and in perfect balance, potential, but unmanifest. Looked at from the ingoing side of the Bodhisattva. Nishyanda Buddha is seen in the glorified bodies of the Tathagatas, looked at from the forthgoing side of Buddhahood, 
Nishyanta Buddha is seen in the radiant personalities of the Tathagatas ready and eager to manifest the inherent love and wisdom of the Dharmakaya. Dharmata Buddha is Buddhahood in itself nature of perfect oneness, in whom absolute tranquility prevails. As noble wisdom, Dharmata Buddha transcends all differentiated knowledge, is the goal of intuitive self-realization, and is the self-nature of the Tathagatas. As noble wisdom, Dharmata Buddha is the ultimate principle of reality from which all things derive their being and truthfulness, but which in itself transcends all predicates. Dharmata Buddha is the central sun, which holds all, illumines all. Its inconceivable essence is made manifest in the outflowing glory of Nishyanda Buddha and in the transformations of the Nirmana Buddha. Then said Mahamadi. Pray tell us, blessed one, more about the Dharmakaya? The blessed one replied. We have been speaking of it in terms of Buddhahood, but it is inscrutable and beyond predicate, we may just as well speak of it as the truth body, or the truth principle of ultimate reality, Paramartha. This ultimate principle of reality may be considered as it is manifested under seven aspects. First, as Zidagakara, it is the world of spiritual experience and the abode of the Tathagatas on their outgoing mission of emancipation. It is noble wisdom manifested as the principle of irradiancy and individuation. Second, as jnana, it is the mind world and its principle of the intellection and consciousness. Third is dristi, it is the realm of dualism which is the physical world of birth and death, wherein are manifested all the differentiations of thinker, thinking, and thought about and wherein are manifested the principles of sensation, perception, discrimination, desire, attachment and suffering. Fourth, because of the greed, anger, infatuation, suffering and need of the physical world incident to discrimination and detachment, it reveals a world beyond the realm of dualism, wherein it appears as the integrating principle of charity and sympathy. Fifth, in a realm still higher, which is the abode of the bodhisattva stages, and is analogous to the mind world, where the interests of heart transcend those of the mind, it appears as the principle of compassion and self-giving. Sixth, in the spiritual realm where the bodhisattvas attain Buddhahood, it appears as the principle of perfect love, karuna. Here the last clinging to an ego self is abandoned, and the bodhisattva enters into his self-realization of noble wisdom, which is the bliss of the Tathagata's perfect enjoyment of his inmost nature. Seventh is prajna it is the active aspect of the ultimate principle, wherein both the forthgoing and the incoming principles are alike implicit and potential and wherein both wisdom and love are in perfect balance, harmony and the oneness. These are the seven aspects of the ultimate principle of the Dharmakaya, by reason of which all things are made manifest and perfected and then reintegrated, and all remaining within its inscrutable oneness, with no signs of individuation, nor beginning, nor succession, nor ending, we speak of it as Dharmakaya, as ultimate principle, as Buddhahood, as Nirvana. What matters it? They are only other names for noble wisdom. Mahamadi, you and all Bodhisattva Mahasattvas should avoid the erroneous reasoning of the philosophers and seek for self realization of noble wisdom. Chapter 13 Nirvana. Then said Mahamadi to the Blessed One Pray tell us about Nirvana. The Blessed One replied The term Nirvana is used with many different meanings by different people but these people may be divided into four groups. There are people who are suffering, or who are afraid of suffering, and who think of nirvana, there are philosophers who try to discriminate nirvana, there are the class of disciples who think of nirvana in relation to themselves. And finally there is the nirvana of the Buddhas. Those who are suffering or who fear suffering, think of nirvana as an escape and recompense. They imagine that nirvana consists in the future annihilation of the senses and the sense minds, they are not aware that universal mind and nirvana are one, and that this life and death world and nirvana are not to be separated. These ignorant ones, instead of meditating on the imagelessness of nirvana, talk of different ways of emancipation. Being ignorant of, or not understanding, the teachings of the Tathagatas, they cling to the notion of nirvana that is outside what is seen of the mind, and, thus, go on rolling themselves along with the wheel of life and death. As to the nirvanas discriminated by the philosophers. There really are none. 
some philosophers conceive nirvana to be found where the mind system no more operates, owing to the cessation of the elements that make up personality and its world, or is found where there is utter indifference to the objective world and its impermanency. Some conceive nirvana to be a state where there is no recollection of the past or present, just as when a lamp is extinguished, or when a seed is burnt, or when a fire goes out, because then there is the cessation of all the substrata, which is explained by the philosophers as the non-rising of discrimination. But this is not nirvana, because nirvana does not consist in simple annihilation and vacuity. Again, some philosophers explain deliverance as though it was the mere stopping of discrimination, as when the wind stops blowing, or as when one by self-effort gets rid of the dualistic view of knower and known, or gets rid of the notions of permanency and impermanency, or gets rid of the notions of good and evil, or overcomes passion by means of knowledge to them, nirvana is deliverance. Some, seeing inform the bearer of pain alarmed by the notion of form and look for happiness in a world of no form. Some conceive that in consideration of individuality and generality recognizable in all things inner and outer, that there is no destruction, and that all beings maintain their being forever and, in this eternality, see nirvana. Others see the eternally of things in the conception of nirvana, as the absorption of the finite soul in the supreme Atman or who see all things as a manifestation of the vital force of some supreme spirit, to which all return, and some, who are especially silly, declare that there are two primary things, a primary substance and a primary soul. That react differently upon each other, and thus produce all things from the transformations of qualities, some think that the world is born of action and interaction, and that no other cause is necessary. Others think that Ishvara is free creator of all things, clinging to these foolish notions, there is no awakening, and they consider nirvana to consist in the fact that there is no awakening. Some imagine that nirvana is where self-nature exists in its own right, unhampered by other self-natures, as the variegated feathers of a peacock, or various precious crystals, or the pointedness of a thorn. Some conceive being to be nirvana, some non-being while others conceive that all things in nirvana are not to be distinguished from one another. Some, thinking that time is the creator and that as the rise of the world depends on time, they conceive that nirvana consists in the recognition of time as nirvana. Some think that there will be nirvana when the twenty-five truths are generally accepted, or when the king observes the six virtues, and some religionists think that nirvana is the attainment of paradise. These views severally advanced by the philosophers with their various seasonings are not in accord with logic, nor are they acceptable to the wise. They all conceive nirvana dualistically and in some causal connection, by these discriminations philosophers imagine nirvana, but where there is no rising and no disappearing, how can there be discrimination? Each philosopher relying on his own textbook from which he draws his understanding, sins against the truth, because truth is not where he imagines it to be. The only result is that it sets his mind to wandering about and becoming more confused as nirvana is not to be found by mental searching, the more his mind becomes confused the more he confuses other people. As to the notion of nirvana as held by disciples and masters who still cling to the notion of an ego self and who try to find it by going off by themselves into solitude. Their notion of nirvana is an eternity of bliss like the bliss of the samadhis for themselves. They recognize that the world is only a manifestation of mind, and that all discriminations are of the mind, and so they forsake social relations, and practice various spiritual disciplines, and in solitude, seek self-realization of noble wisdom by self-effort. They follow the stages to the sixth and attain the bliss of the samadhis, but as they are still clinging to egoism, they do not attain the turning about at the deepest seat of consciousness, and, therefore, they are not free from the thinking mind and the accumulation of its habit energy. Clinging to the bliss of the samadhis, they pass to their nirvana, but it is not the nirvana of the tathagatas. They are of those who have entered the stream, they must return to this world of life and death. Then said Mahamadi to the Blessed One. When the Bodhisattvas yield up their stock of merit for the emancipation of all beings, they become spiritually one with all animate life, 
they themselves may be purified, but in others there yet remain unexhausted evil and unmatured karma. Pray tell us, blessed one, how the bodhisattvas are given assurance of nirvana. And what is the nirvana of the bodhisattvas? The blessed one replied. Mahamadi, this assurance is not an assurance of numbers nor logic, it is not the mind that is to be assured but the heart. The bodhisattva's assurance comes with the unfolding insight that follows passion hindrances cleared away, knowledge hindrance purified, and egolessness clearly perceived and patiently accepted. As the mortal mind ceases to discriminate, there is no more thirst for life, no more sex lust, no more thirst for learning, no more thirst for eternal life, with the disappearance of these fourfold thirsts, there is no more accumulation of habit energy, with no more accumulation of habit energy the defilements on the face of the universal mind clear away. And the bodhisattva attains self-realization of noble wisdom that is the heart's assurance of nirvana. There are bodhisattvas here and in other Buddha lands who are sincerely devoted to the bodhisattva's mission, and yet who cannot wholly forget the bliss of the samadhis and the peace of nirvana for themselves. The teaching of nirvana in which there is no substrate left behind is revealed according to a hidden meaning for the sake of these disciples who still cling to thoughts of nirvana for themselves, that they may be inspired to exert themselves in the bodhisattva's mission of emancipation for all beings. The transformation Buddhas teach a doctrine of nirvana to meet conditions as they find them, and to give encouragement to the timid and selfish. In order to turn their thoughts away from themselves and to encourage them to a deeper compassion and more earnest zeal for others, they are given assurance as to the future by the sustaining power of the Buddhas of transformation, but not by the Dharmata Buddha. The Dharma, which establishes the truth of noble wisdom, belongs to the realm of the Dharmata Buddha. To the bodhisattvas to the seventh and eighth stages, transcendental intelligence is revealed by the Dharmata Buddha, and the path is pointed out to them, which they are to follow. In the perfect self-realization of noble wisdom that follows the inconceivable transformation death of the bodhisattva's individualized will control, he no longer lives unto himself, but the life that he lives thereafter is the Tathagata's universalized life as manifested in its transformations. In this perfect self-realization of noble wisdom, the bodhisattva realizes that for the Buddhas there is no nirvana. The death of a Buddha, the great parinirvana, is neither destruction nor death, else would it be birth and continuation. If it were destruction, it would be an effect producing deed, which is not. Neither is it a vanishing nor abandonment, neither is it attainment, nor is it of no attainment, neither is it of one significance nor of no significance, for there is no nirvana for the Buddhas. The Tathagata's nirvana is where it is recognized that there is nothing but what is seen of the mind itself, is where, recognizing the nature of the self-mind, one no longer cherishes the dualisms of discrimination, is where there is no more thirst nor grasping, is where there is no more attachment to external things. Nirvana is where the thinking mind with all its discriminations, attachments, aversions and egoism, is forever put away is where logical measures, as they are seen to be inert, are no longer seized upon, is where even the notion of truth is treated with indifference because of its causing bewilderment, is where, getting rid of the four propositions, there is insight into the abode of reality. Nirvana is where the twofold passions have subsided, and the twofold hindrances are cleared away, and the twofold egolessness is patiently accepted, is where, by the attainment of the turning about in the deepest seat of consciousness, self-realization of noble wisdom is fully entered into, that is the nirvana of the Tathagatas. Nirvana is where the bodhisattva stages are passed one after another, is where the sustaining power of the Buddhas upholds the bodhisattvas in the bliss of the samadhis, is where compassion for others transcends all thoughts of self, is where the Tathagata stage is finally realized. Nirvana is the realm of the Dharmata Buddha, it is where the manifestation of noble wisdom that is Buddhahood expresses itself in perfect love for all, it is where the manifestation of perfect love that is Tathagatahood expresses itself in noble wisdom for the enlightenment of all there, indeed, is Nirvana. There are two classes of those who may not enter the Nirvana of the Tathagatas. There are those who have abandoned the Bodhisattva ideals, saying, 
they are not in conformity with the sutras, the codes of morality, nor with emancipation. Then there are the true bodhisattvas who, on account of their original vows made for the sake of all beings, saying, so long as they do not attain nirvana, I will not attain it for myself voluntarily keep themselves out of nirvana. But no beings are left outside by the will of the Tathagatas, someday each and every one will be influenced by the wisdom and love of the Tathagatas of transformation, to lay up a stock of merit and ascend the stages. But, if they only realized it, they are already in the Tathagatas nirvana for, in noble wisdom, all things are in nirvana from the beginning. The concluding final segment of the Lankavatara Sutra sets the stage for the next literary endeavor. Subscribing guarantees your connection to forthcoming wisdom. Your likes and shares are pivotal in spreading Buddha's profound teachings extensively. Let's come together to proliferate this enlightenment, nurturing minds with its deep essence. As we move forward, your support drives our global mission to disseminate these teachings. To continue this enlightening journey, subscribe, and your active engagement through likes and shares broadens the reach of Buddha's wisdom. Your involvement is invaluable in our dedication to enlighten minds with the transformative essence of the Lankavatara Sutra.